Hello. Good morning, everyone. I was tapped to say, go get it started. So we're going to get it started. <laughs> Welcome all everyone here again this morning. If you uh, weren't here last night, you missed but you're here just in time to get something great again. So let's just open up in prayer and then I'll introduce Gary again. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord for the love that You've shown to us, Lord God. And Lord, as we just consider the heavens and the works of Your hands, Lord, when we consider <laughs> the tens of thousands of millions of stars, and we can think about all that You've put on display just to make us wonder about You, And we do wonder, Lord, what are we that You are mindful of us? What are we that You care for us? And yet, Lord, You just made us a little bit lower than the angels and You crowned us with love and compassion. And so, Lord God, we thank You that in this place today, all we need to do to remind ourselves that You're present is, is to breathe in You and realize You're already in there. And then breathe out and realize you're already around us. So Lord, it's, it's never the message that's given, it's always the message that's heard. So Lord, in my heart today, make that ground fertile for the seed that's going to be sown in it. Lord, make it fertile so that a, a, a harvest that's 30 or 60 or 100 times is going to well up in it. And Holy Spirit, have your way in this place today. In your precious name, amen. So, Gary Meller is a good friend of mine and uh, is an awesome man of God. And, and he lives what he teaches. And that's uh, you, you, you heard him last night, you hear his passion, you hear his heart, you see it. And uh, it's... It's not something he puts on when he comes up here. It's something that's... He's, he's actually louder outside the church, trust me. <laughs> so can you put your hands together and just welcome Gary as he comes. Well, praise the Lord. I, uh, you all feeling good this morning? Awesome. Awesome. I, uh, I slept well. I woke up very tired and... It seems like like uh, mornings. It, it, there's a word for mornings. It's called nighttime, and, uh, and so. But God is good. God is really good, and I just feel like we need to we need to just turn our eyes right back to the Lord again here and thank Him again because, you know what? If it weren't for Him, we wouldn't be here. And He has been faithful. He. I just heard a testimony from Dolores here, and and found out um, Cody was his name, right? Joey, Joey, uh, had cancer and been to the specialist and he's cancer free. And, the, you know, that means something to me. That, that really that resonates in my spirit big time because particularly that testimony right there because I've been going to the Cross Cancer Institute and I was praying for a dear friend, a mother in the Lord, and uh, was also able to go and visit an 18-year-old girl who has bone cancer. They're talking about amputating her arm. Uh, Justin Bieber had visited her when she was here and uh, was able to pray for other people while I was out there. And, you know, we didn't see them just get up and walk out uh, of their bed. And, you know, I, I wanted to see that. And and, and as I was um, praying for, for Muriel, I would see her get better. You know, the first day that I went in there, she had stomach pain, and that's where the cancer was, and, and she had knee pain, and we prayed for her, and the, the pain left the stomach, and the pain left the, the knees, and she was smiling, and she was all happy, and I got a phone call the next day that she had had two strokes, and was now semi in a semi-coma, and I was, I, I, you know, I was like, 
how did that happen? <laughs> that, that, that is not the same as what, what, uh, what I was praying. And, and so I went back again the next day and said, we're going to take this thing out. And, and, and Sue, you had been there, and Pastor Archie had been there. There had been people praying for her. And uh, we, we were hearing from God. We knew that we were hearing from God that he was going to heal her. So I prayed again, and her breathing got better. She seemed to be doing okay. And it was like, you know what? This is going to be, this is going to be all right. God's going to look after her. This is, we're going, we're going good. Went back again the next day with a friend of mine, and he was just like, <laughs> just loose the cannons, and, and we're going to shoot this thing. And as I was driving home, I felt such peace inside of my spirit that, wow, that she's healed. There's, I can't even pray for her to be healed anymore. The only thing that I can do is just respond with gratitude and thankfulness that, that God in His faithfulness has reached her. And wow, even while she's in a coma right now, she's, she's having this conversation with Jesus and we're going to have a testimony and we're going to have a mentorship that's going to happen. It is going to be so good. And then I got a call on, actually I saw it on Facebook first and I called my pastor and on Tuesday night she had passed away. And I was like, Father, I don't, I don't understand this. But, I, as a matter of fact, uh, I, a little more than don't understand this. I'm actually a little bit ticked about that. I'm not okay with this, God. It's not okay when death and cancer steals things. But inside my spirit, there is this, God, your word is still true. You still heal the sick. You still raise the dead. You still set people free. And despite the things that I have encountered, God, it doesn't change the fact that you're still good. My faith is not based on the circumstances. My faith is based on the finished work of Jesus. He is risen from the dead. He does love us. He's always with us. He never forsakes us. And that's something to get excited about and I just inside of me I just say Papa God thank you thank you that you are faithful thank you that you come to us in our darkest hour and even though there may be stories where we, we don't understand what's going on but Papa you still heal people like Joey and he's cancer free hallelujah cancer is under Jesus' feet diabetes is under Jesus' feet arthritis is under Jesus' feet I just huh it's good. Father, Papa, God is good, 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 good. It's because of His love and because we're worthy. We're worthy because of who we are. It's just, so I, I just, yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the testimony, Dolores. Thank you. Thank you that, that, that God is doing these things and He still is. And, you know, sometimes we, we give the, the, the great stories. We give the great stories of how um, legs grow out and miracles, spectacular miracles happened. And we, we tend to ignore the fact that this didn't happen over here. Because we just want to build your faith up. We just want to, it's almost like if we tell you a good story, then that's the foundation of your faith. And that's just twisted and whacked. <laughs> that is so wrong. Because your faith is not built upon an experience, even though I believe in, in the experiences of God with all my heart. We need to experience Him. We need to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to experience what it is to lay our hands on people and see them healed. We need to experience what it is to pick up a little child and go, oh, this is what you're talking about when you say this is of the kingdom of heaven. And we, we need to do that. We need to experience it because our God is an experiential God. He made us with feelings. He made us with emotions. He, he's the one who created us. You know, if we are created in the image of God, then, then, and, and we have emotion, and we have the need to be touched, and we have the need to be embraced. We have the need to hear words of affirmation. We have the, we have, you know, that, that was built inside of us. That means that there's got to be some experience. To deny who you are as a human is wrong. God made you the way that you are. God made you to receive His love. God made you to receive it. And see, the, the point is, where we get twisted, is we start saying, well, I need my love from you. If you don't give me love, if I start looking at you, and then you let me down, now I'm, on, now I'm getting shipwrecked. And God made me to be loved by Him so that I can give love out. Uh, that's, a, that's a very, very important point for us to know. He says that, that we give love out. You know, 1 Corinthians says, 13 says that love bears all things, it hopes all things, it, in, it, it endures, it keeps on giving, it keeps on giving, it doesn't lose hope. 
But you can only do that when you know who you are, when you have received that love inside of you. And so you, we come to the Father and we sit in His presence and we receive and receive and receive of Him so that we can give it out. But that doesn't change the fact that you, that, that, that God intended for you to have joy, that He intended for you to have this, this sense of, oh man, you know, it's like, why doesn't everybody just stand up here for a minute? We're just going to do something. It's something really practical. You know, how many of you believe that God lives inside of you? The Holy Spirit is inside of you, right? Okay? That means God, it says in Colossians chapter 2, that God, the fullness of the Godhead in deity is in Jesus Christ bodily. The fullness, and you are complete in Him. Complete. Complete means complete. It means that there, you can't add to it, you can't take away from it. It's complete. It's the fullness of the Godhead, the, the fullness of God that said in the beginning, let there be light and there was light. The, the fullness of the Godhead that said to, to Jairus, just believe, I'll go raise your daughter from the dead. The fullness of the Godhead that, that raised Jesus from the dead after he was crucified and exalted him to the highest place, that Godhead lives in you by his Spirit. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He, he, Jesus said, don't look for the kingdom of heaven all around you because, you know, you, you're going to be disappointed. It's not an outside thing, it's an inside thing. The, the kingdom of heaven lives inside of you and it grows inside of you and is manifested and then it shows up in, in, in the justice and the righteousness and the, and the love and the, and the government of the kingdom of heaven, as it says in Psalm 89. But it's in here. The kingdom of heaven is inside of you. The king lives inside of you. Okay, so so what I want you to do is I want to, I want you to give yourself a hug, just wrap your arms around yourselves, because God wants a hug from you. You see, I, I, I'm giving you something physical and practical here because it's a physical, practical God that we're dealing with. You know, I believe some of you are going to start feeling healing right now. You're going to start feeling something because what you're doing is you're activating and you're saying, I'm engaging you, Father. I'm engaging you, Holy Spirit. I'm engaging you, Jesus, because you love me and you're actually in me. You know? I'll soak it up. You're like a little kid here. <laughs> you love me, God. <laughs> you can't help yourself. <laughs> You love me so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I say it and I ask you for something, you love me. It's like a little kid. Can I have that? Can I have that? No, no. Please bat those big old eyes. That's okay. <laughs> he loves you. He loves you. And sometimes we've got to activate ourselves. You can have a seat now if you want. If you want to dance, you can dance too. But sometimes we have to activate ourselves. We have to move our bodies and say, we're going to, we're going to step into to what you have for us. Because, because we're our human beings. You see, when you go out and see somebody with a limp, you see somebody um, where they tell you that something is, is wrong in their body and they would like, and, and you have the opportunity to pray for them, you're going to physically have to come up to them and say, Hi, Annie, how you doing? And you take her hand, in Jesus' name, bless you. Now that's physical, right? You know? I can't just, because Jesus said, go, preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, um, but you got to go to the city. You can't just simply sit in your, your place and say, well, I've got all authority from Jesus, so I'm sitting in my living room eating my chips and drinking my Coca-Cola. And uh, I just, Father, bless Calgary, bless Calgary, bless Calgary. Let the kingdom of heaven be preached because I have authority. Well, <laughs> you're, you're going to come up empty because you've got to go to Calgary. And Calgary is a nice city. <laughs> uh, he, he, Jesus said, go to the cities. And that requires our physical bodies. You know, I don't even know why we're, we're, we're connecting on this right now, but, but whatever. God is good. There, there's, there's this, Jesus, He didn't simply say, well, I love you and I'm looking over the balconies and I'm gonna provide a plan of salvation for you. So, um, just be encouraged and have hope and, and, and the word is, the word is all you need and, you know, it's all good. It says in John chapter 1 that the, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It says the Word came and, and Jesus walked among us. He was the light. He came to His own and His own received Him not. It said He came full of grace and truth. Not full of law, but full of grace and truth. 
When God was concerned about our hearts, when He was concerned about us, He didn't just simply say from a distance, well, oh well, I, I really feel for you and it's, you know, but you, those God helps those who help themselves. No, God came in and helped us who couldn't help ourselves. When you don't have legs to walk, God comes along and says, I'm going to give you legs. When you don't have eyes to see, He becomes your eyes. I remember when I was first got came back to the Lord in 1988 and I was... Uh, a young guy like I am now, and uh, uh, well, you know, I'm gonna live for eternity, so time doesn't mean anything to me anymore. I'm <laughs> I'm young forever. Hallelujah! And I just keep praying, Lord, my eyes. Moses' eyes were not dim, so those eyeglasses that I have, well, we'll just put those on the hold for now. But it does sometimes get difficult to read the words. <laughs> but I'm still young. Anyways, I uh, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> What? Huh, okay. A anyways, when when uh, when he when Jesus came full of grace and truth, and he came and he said, "I want to save you," and 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 when I was, here's what I was going to say. I was I was at my uh, at a youth meeting for for young adults, and and my pastor was talking about you got to forgive those who offended you. Because First John says, "Forgive as you have been forgiven." It says, "If you're going to walk, in, if you're going to be a believer and have fellowship with Jesus, you got to walk in the light as He is in the light." The the one who is of the seed of, of God doesn't commit sin. We are now the children of God, so we got to do what Jesus did, not because we're trying to attain to it, but because that's who we are. And He says, "So you got to forgive." And I'm like, "That's cool. That's cool. Yep. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Forgive those who offended you. Yep. Yep. That's cool, Brian." Wow. You don't talk about Brian. You don't talk. No, that's not okay. I rebuke that devil in Jesus' name. Well, we're here to praise you, Jesus. Thank you that I'm forgiven, Jesus. Thank you that you got to forgive Brian. Shut up. There's a reason we put that in the back corner. There's a reason that we threw away the lock and key. We don't talk about that. We don't. In fact, that's not even a subject in our lives. And Jesus said, "Listen, if you want to go forward in this." You're gonna to have to deal with this thing, this thing, this person called Brian, and I'm like, "Well, we can't do that, God. You know what he did to me? Do you know the pain that I've gone through? Do you know the suffering? Do you do you understand what 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 that did to my life? No, I'm the one in the right. He's the one in the wrong. I'm the one who's justice. He needs to be killed for what he did. I'm the one. No, why would you ask me to do such a hideous, offensive? Don't you know what I went through? And he says, do you know what I went through? Do you know what I did for you? Uh, you know, it wasn't that God was trying to, to do a one-up and say, well, see, because because we hear this a lot. Finish off your plate because there's children starving in Africa. And then we put this guilt and condemnation on it that you've got to perform because something worse is happening over here. It wasn't that at all. It was that God was trying to teach me a lesson that because I've made you brand new, because I took that thing for you, you don't have to live under that tyranny anymore. I'm going to transform you. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to open up your prison doors. I couldn't see that. All I could see because all the enemy ever put inside of my life was... Here's the big bad stuff. Here's the Goliath in your life. Here's the wickedness that has happened. And it's so bad and it's so scary. And if you dare to go down that road, you're going to get destroyed. And so there was, there was this, this fear that filled my life that said, if you talk about the one who hurt me, if you bring that subject up, if you broach those subjects that are, that are offensive to me, I'm going to be, I'm going to be wrecked and I'm going to end up doing worse things and I'm going to be I'm going to be totally unhappy and, and, and it's wrong. You shouldn't do that. But what he was really saying is, I love you too much to let you continue in your pain. So I'm going to transform you. I'm going to set you free. And so I, I sat there and I, and I was, I was going, well, God, I'm going to be honest with you. I can't forgive him. Now you would think that's the end of the story. Because if you can't forgive, Jesus said, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. If you do not forgive your brother whom you have seen, or, or even the one who has offended you, your Father in heaven won't forgive you. So if you can't forgive, you're in trouble. Again, now, now, if I leave it right there, now we're talking religion. 
Because now I just put something on you. If, you're go if we're going to stay at this place, now you have to come up with some strength somehow. You need to go and get some counseling. You need to do this. Or you, 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 you. You have to find a way because if you don't, God's going to be mad at you. He's going to hold your sin against you and you might not even make it to heaven. That is not a good news story. That's a really bad news story. But here's the truth. And this is the truth for so many people that are in the streets right now, that are living in the businesses, that are working in their businesses and, and being in the hospital in the education system, there are so many people in this exact position. They know that they got it, that, that they're being hurt. They know that they're being tormented, but they cannot, they do not have the ability to forgive and let it go. I, I have talked to countless, countless people, and, and literally, because I didn't count them, so maybe it was three, maybe it was a hundred, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I've talked to, to these people, and they go, you know, I should just forgive them, I should just let it go, ah, oh, whatever, it's water under the bridge, but, but they can't. Because the servant of sin is, uh, uh, the servant who commits sin is the slave of sin. They don't have the ability and they don't have the power to get free from their sin. And so I said to Jesus, as I was kneeling on my chair, whether it was a blue one like this, I don't know, but I'm like, Jesus, I can't. I can't do that. It's impossible for me. And that was part of my breakthrough because I was honest enough to say, no, I can't do it. I wasn't going to be religious. But then I said this, but if you will forgive him through me, and I can do it in you, I'm willing to do that. And Jesus said, that's good enough for me. I forgive him. So I said, through Jesus, I forgive. And whoosh, it started to break. Things started coming off of me, and I started to just say, Wow, I can do this. And now today, yeah, you're forgiven. Absolutely you're forgiven. How could I hold it? You didn't know what you were doing. You, you were under a bondage of your own, and you were being tormented and stuff, and you were just lashing out in your pain because you were looking for, for, for that God-filled vacuum to be filled, and you didn't know how to fill it. But now I've become a new creation, and I'm not bound to that shame, and I'm not bound to that condemnation, and I'm not bound to that addiction anymore. I am bound to the love of God. I'm a son in Jesus Christ. I've become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And now, because He has enabled me, He became the forgiveness for me. So now I forgive him, and now, as it says, I confess before him. And there's a difference between confession and asking for forgiveness. First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess your sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. So, when I go to a judge, as I did in 1988, and I stood before the court... And they said, how do you plead? I confessed and said, I'm guilty. Yes, I did it. I, why did you do it? You know what? There is no excuse. I'm guilty. I did not ask for forgiveness. And the court wasn't open to the idea of forgiveness. There were lots of people who tried. Please, uh, uh, it's not in character. And they spent thousands of dollars through lawyers begging for forgiveness and begging for leniency. And they didn't get it. And then I stood before him and said, you, you, you play, then you pay. And, and so forget it. I'm not wasting $20,000 on a lawyer. I'm not wasting my time on, on trying to, to be something that I am. You know what? I'm coming clean and I'm changing my life right now. I was a non-Christian at the time. I was not following God. And, and, but I figured I'm going to try and get myself straightened out. So I just said, yep, I did it. There's no excuse. I need to change. All right, and I got the exact same sentence everybody else did. So what they paid twenty grand for, I paid six hundred dollars for, um, because that was my fine at that time. And then they gave me my record, and they gave me, you know, all the stuff that goes with 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 what I did. But my point is this: when I confessed, it was only admission of what I'd where I was. Uh, we're, we're trying so hard to, to do something that God didn't ask us to do. He said, you just come to me and you confess and you just make yourself open before me and I'll do everything for you. So I come before him and I say, Lord, yeah, I did do that. I was angry. I was filled with hatred. I was filled with bitterness. I was all of these things. But now here I am. I wish I hadn't done it. And he says, okay, 
No problem. Here's the blood of Jesus. Here's who I am. I forgive you. You're washed. You're clean. You're absolutely set free. And now, because of that, I've become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because he said, all unrighteousness is removed from my life. How much is all? 100%. All unrighteousness has been removed from your life. If you have believed in Jesus and you have looked to Him, you are righteous today, not your own righteousness, because all you did was say, I'm guilty. And He says, well, if you're guilty, then I'm going to make you righteous. I mean, come on. <laughs> Bank robber. Yep, yeah, I'm guilty. Well, I'm going to make you a millionaire then. <laughs> are you kidding me? But we come to our God, and this is why He's so great, and this is the amazing gospel, the amazing good news, that you can go and you can talk to people and say, you know what, if you just come to Jesus, He'll make you all better. Uh, you know, all better doesn't mean that your past suddenly changes and, and, and suddenly you win the lottery and stuff like that. But what it is saying is that it changes you and it makes you a brand new creation. It makes you a whole brand new person. And so I have no problem going to people like I told you last night when I was talking to the women who were involved in immorality and the guys who were involved in addictions and saying, you know what, God's not mad at you. He loves you. He's actually forgiven you. And he's got nothing but good to say to you. Because it's the truth. It's absolutely the truth. And if he's got nothing against me, and if he's declared me to be righteous, and he's declared his goodness to me, then why would he withhold his, his provision from me? Why would he withhold healing? Why would he withhold any of that stuff? The only thing that is part of me is, okay, Jesus, yeah, I believe you. I believe you. So now, all, unright all unrighteousness has been removed from my life. Here's where I find a whole bunch of Christians um, stumble. Because we, we live in this, as, as Greek individuals, we don't live in, in circular, we live in linear. So, I was born today, I'm in my life right now, I'm going down the timeline, then I will die, then I will be in heaven with Jesus, and eternity will be going on and on and on and on. And, and we, we look at it that way, so when we, when we come to Jesus, and we have that great moment where the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to us that we are forgiven, that we are His children, that, that if we will just say yes to Him and, and say, I believe you, that we become transformed. We become the righteousness. So all of this stuff that I had from right here when my life began all the way up to here has been forgiven. I'm clean. Nothing is held against me. Hallelujah. I am free. I'm a son of God. Woohoo! I'm free. I'm walking as a Christian. I just sinned. Oh, i got to ask for forgiveness because I'm dirty now. And, and what the scripture is really saying is, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, 16, the whole chapter, but in the first few verses, I, I, when I memorize scripture, I just kind of find the area, because chapters and verses came from King James or whoever it was, and I'm just figuring if I can get the word in me, that's good enough. Hebrews says, somewhere in the Bible it said, and I, I like that, I like that a lot, but Ephesians chapter 1 says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord. Jesus Christ, blessed be Him, the, the Father of Jesus. We give thanks for Him. And then it says, um, God predestined us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love as sons. Before the foundation of the world is a little bit before the day that I was born. That's like way over here, man. Way over here. You know? Here's the earth, and here's the stars, and here's the sun, and they're just chaos. It's mindless darkness, blackness. It's it's they 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 don't even exist. We're we're right now at the point where God is coming, and like a, the Holy Spirit just brooding and vibrating and coming over the blackness and the darkness, and then God says, "Let there be light," and boom, everything starts changing, and suns begin to the sun gets formed, and the land gets formed, and and then the animals and the trees and the, and man gets formed, and, and we're way over here, and I have. Adam isn't even created yet and I'm in his heart and his mind before the foundation of the world you can say you did this I saw where you were on Friday night ah God showed me in a dream what happened I, I, I know what's going on I, you know, the, when I stayed in Brasilia at this, this, this wonderful woman of God her name is Los Angela and she is a prophetess and uh, she wanted to get married. That's the reason she got saved, actually. Somebody said, if you give your life to Jesus, he'll help you find a husband. She says, I'm in. And she, she said, yeah, gave her life to Jesus and came to church. And it was, doo -doo 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 
Who do is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? You're the one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she was just she was hunting for her husband. She wanted a husband like anything. And finally, after a year, a pastor came along, took her took her aside, and said, "Stop it. <laughs> Get yourself in line with Jesus. Let Him prepare you. Let Him bring the husband to you." And she's okay, I'll do that. And she just began to hear God operates in, in the prophetic, just a, an amazing woman of God. And she, she, this guy came into church and, and the Lord said, there he is. That's your husband. And she's like, yeah! But he didn't tell him that. And he looked at her and went, uh, uh. <laughs> And and uh, so she just continued to pray and said, Lord, give me my husband. Give him a, and just bring us together. And, and he liked her because he was in ministry. She was prophetic. So they operated as a team. And it, it was just beautiful the way that they were getting breakthrough. But he had no intention of marrying her. He didn't like her. And one day this they were sitting in church and this prophetic person come in and it sees him and it says, you two are husband and wife. Say hello to your wife. Say hello to your, to your husband. This is... And, and the, publicly in a church service and this guy's eyes open up. He and he goes, no, I do not love you and you will never be my wife. And just, I mean, you talk about humiliation for the poor girl. <laughs> and, and she went, that's my husband. <laughs> I am going to pray for him even harder. And I'm like, wow, your faith is not based on evidence. Your faith is based on the Word of God. Like, it was just amazing. So she continued on. They sat in a private session and, and another prophetic said, why are you resisting the will of God? This is your wife. Marry her. And he goes, no, I do not want to marry her. I refuse to. And she just, you know, there were, she would cry and she would cry. And Lord, what do you, what, I, I don't understand. You said, and, and finally, uh, the Lord came to her and said, release him. Give him one week to repent, but release him. So she came to him and said, listen, you have one week. I release you. You don't have to marry me, um, but you have one week to repent. Uh, if you do not repent, we're done. We're not working together in ministry, and he didn't want to lose that. And he says, I need to go pray. So he went into his prayer closet, and he's like, oh, Lord. And he's at his home, and Hasangela's at her home. And the Lord said to Hasangela, I want you to go see what he's saying. <laughs> So come with me. So in the spirit she goes up, and there he is just praying. And she heard every single word that he prayed. Uh, uh, word for word. The guy was saying, Lord, she's not the right size. She's not a virgin. Because she'd been divorced. Her, her first husband died. She had three children. She, she doesn't have a, a, a music ministry. I want someone who's young. I want someone who's everything that she is. And I don't want to marry her. And, just, and she's hearing all of this. And uh, uh, the next day he comes to her and she says, stop, I have something to tell you. And she tells him everything that, that he said in his prayer closet. He's like, ah, I can't even pray alone anymore. And, and, and God showed her. And, and then he said, all right, I repent. I will marry you, but we will never be intimate. We will only walk together. We'll be friends, but we're not going to sleep in the same bed. And she's like, cool, I'll take it. <laughs> she was her husband. And, uh, and the Lord told her, give it 24 hours. And, uh, she, they, they got married. They came to the honeymoon. And he says, you sleep in that bed. And she went, oh my God. He's serious. Jesus. What? Huh? Huh? I know I said yes, but oh no. So they slept the next morning. She got up, got dressed, and she brought him back breakfast in bed. And, uh, they ate their breakfast, and he says, well, why don't we go for a walk? And uh, so they started going for a walk, and her hand brushed against his hand, and he, he, he just held it. And all of a sudden, he picks his hand up and he goes, Los Angela, your hands, they're so soft. Wow, I never saw that before. And then he looks at her and goes, huh, I've never seen that smile. You're so beautiful. That was 24 hours to the minute. And they have children and married. I mean, it, it just, oh, it's, the romantic in me likes this story a lot. And, and it's not even related to my point. I'm telling you that because God could show you in a dream, I know what you did, all of that. But, but what I'm saying is, even if God shows you and sees all that sin, if I'm righteous and I know who I am, it doesn't matter what you say. 
It doesn't matter what accusations come against me. It doesn't matter because now I know that I'm righteous. But here's the thing. When you know that you're righteous, and you know, I gave the example of the people who committed adultery, the people who stole the money. The reason that they did that is because they were living under law and they thought they'd been forgiven up to this point and they were trying to live to a standard, but it began to eat at them and they, be and they just began to live under that, that tyranny of religion. Even though they loved God and even though they were, they were passionate about Him and they had great ministry and they did great things, but what they didn't understand is who they really are. Because when you begin to see that, you know what, I really am righteous, and you begin to look at this, that I, this is who I am, this is, this is what God has made me, this is the purity that is in me, and you're walking along in that, when this temptation comes, you're oblivious to it because of what you're looking at in Jesus. See, see, when you, as this revelation begins to sink inside of you, the next time that familiar spirit comes up to you, familiar because it's familiar with your habits in the past, and says, hey, you remember when you did that thing? You remember how that made you feel? It was so good? Hey, hey why don't you do that? And you're, 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 you're focusing on Jesus and you're saying, I'm righteous. And what is right? What is righteous? Righteous is right the way God intended it. What did God intend for humanity? He intended provision. He intended health. He intended um, deliverance. He intended for setting the captive free. He intended for people to live in the fullness of the joy that He has for them in His presence. So I'm looking at this righteousness. I'm looking at Jesus. I'm looking at how as He is pure, I am pure. As I, I'm looking at Him and as He is filled with authority, He's given authority to me. I'm looking at Him and I'm seeing as, as He is filled with love, I'm filled with love. I'm looking at Him and seeing right as He is in the way of government and in the way of education, in the way of business. I'm looking at Him and I'm going, I'm, I'm being right as you are right, God. I'm doing as you would do. I'm, I'm doing as you would do. You should do that sin. I, what? Shut up. I say, Why would I sin? I see Jesus. You see, when the, the secret of, of, of being a son, the secret of being a daughter, the secret of walking in the power of God is, is focusing on Jesus. It's focusing on who you are. Jesus said in John chapter 8, I love that chapter, but Jesus said, you don't know who I am, and you don't even hardly know anything about yourself because you don't know where I come from. But I know who I am because I know where I came from. I know my origin and I know where I'm going. And so because I know who I am, the Father is always with me because I always do the things that please Him. I'm always walking in unity with Him. I'm always walking in love with Him. Well, same thing with you. When you begin to understand, where did I come from? Who am I? When you understand that righteousness, and when you're walking in that, now you're seeing the Father. Now you're seeing what He's doing. And, and you start doing what He's doing. And when the enemy comes along and says, hey, why don't you do this compromise? And it's like, I don't have time to waste on stupidity like you're trying to tell me. Why would I sell the most beautiful diamond in the world to get this fake, puny little cute zirconia when I see this? Nobody is tempted to steal a glass, a shiny piece of glass when they got the Hope Diamond. Like it's, how, how are you supposed to tempt me with this? Look at what I have. Look at who I am. I, I, I see what God has given me and you're telling me to do that? I mean... Come on, the ante has got to be as good as God or it's not worth it. Because I'm walking in His love. And when, when it says in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, actually 6, 7, 8 and 9, it says that you have been cleansed from all unrighteousness. Now the revelation comes that this is who I am. Uh, you mean I'm, I'm the most valuable? I'm the most loved? I'm the most appreciated uh, in God's eyes? And you mean that you're going to give me the kingdom? Because he said it's his joy to give you the kingdom. It's his joy. And what the enemy does is he 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 uh, he comes along to to thwart and to take your eyes off it. See, the, the only authority that the enemy has in our lives is the authority that we give him by believing what he says to us. When you look at the temptation of Adam and Eve, he did not come in and say, I'm going to force you to eat that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't come in and, and just, because he couldn't. 
He didn't have the authority. He didn't have the power. He didn't have the dominion. He didn't have the goods to make this thing happen. And so what, what, what he did was he, he said, look at what I'm saying. Look at my definition of this. And, and, and he, he tried to, like a, nothing against used car salesmen, but like a used car salesman, he began to paint up this horrible looking vehicle and said, this car is most beautiful. This is worth more than a than than a Bugatti. This is worth more than a Lamborghini. This thing is so beautiful. Oh man, you want this vehicle? And they 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 buy the vehicle. They start it, and there's a big poof of black smoke and parts falling as they're driving away because they just got sold a bill of goods based on a lie. The only way that the enemy could come to Eve, the only way that he could come and present a deception was by getting her to turn her eyes off of Jesus, off of the Father, off of God, and onto what was said, you can't do it. And when that happened, and she began to, she ate of the fruit, and then Adam ate of the fruit, now their eyes were turned on them, and now authority and dominion had been given back, given over to the devil. The devil had to operate and can only operate in the, the God-given structure of government that he, that, that God established. So when, when we were, when we came into this world born in sin, and that's what David said, in sin I was conceived. He wasn't talking about how his mom and dad were, were horrible, immoral people. He was talking about a sin nature that he had. He was born with it. The most natural thing in the world for him in that condition was to, to sleep with Bathsheba. The most natural thing in the world for him was to kill uh, Uriah, her husband. It was natural for him to do things that were wrong because he was born in sin. He had this nature inside of him. It was, it was natural because we were born in sin. And so now we're caught in this place and we are under a dominion of evil. We're under a dominion in a, in a, in a satanic inspired environment where he says, I have legitimate authority to wreak havoc in your life. That's why witch doctors and, uh, um, shapeshifters like Coney and, and the ones that are around here, can do what they can do by the power of the devil where they uh, literally, literally, they'll be, they'll be standing there and all of a sudden they're turned into a crocodile and be gone. Or into a rat. Hey, that sounds unbelievably crazy to us. We're like, well, what? Never heard of that before. But I, I, have, I have sat and talked with a, with a, a man from the Shushwap First Nations and he was saying how God called him to his people to be a pastor to him and he confronted the witch doctor and the witch doctor beat the daylights out of him and never laid a finger on him. And he came up to him and boom! And he was thrown across the room and he watched as the man transformed into an animal or reptile, whatever it was, and slithered away. Or ran away, whatever it was. And he kept telling me, he kept saying to me, do you know how big the devil is? I mean, it's such a war that I'm in. It's such a horrible thing. The reason that that kind of stuff can happen is because there has been a dominion and a government and authority that has been given over to Satan by Adam through the fall. And, 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 uh, and so when we are in darkness and we don't know Jesus and when we don't know righteousness, we're walking in slavery. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 8, he says, the one who commits sin is a servant to sin, but whom the Son sets free is free indeed. There is a difference between a servant committing sin and a son committing sin. When I know that I'm a righteous son, when I know and, and I'm walking in that freedom and in that truth, as you walk in that freedom and truth, when you commit a sin, you're not held in bondage under it. But if you're a servant living under religion because uh, because you've been taught that if I read my Bible and I study my Bible and I hide His Word in my heart, which is a good thing, that's straight from Psalm 119. Uh, when, I, when I'm taught that I've got to do this stuff, and it's not about who I am, but it's about what I do, I receive His favor because of what I do instead of who I am. When I commit a sin, I'm operating as a servant. Now I'm in bondage and I'm a slave. And that's, I mean, that's just, that, that's a lie from, from the enemy. It's, it's a, a manipulation and it's a bondage that the enemy has, has done to hold people everywhere all across this country into slavery and saying, you don't measure up, you don't have what it takes, you'll never be able to overcome this thing because look it, I got you to read the Bible, I got you to memorize the Bible, I got you to pray, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you speak in tongues and look at what the stuff you do. Man, I, when I was in Bible college, I, I had to repent of this, change my thinking and change my mind. But I was offended with the baptism of the Holy Spirit for a long time. Really offended with it. Because I would sit in Bible college 
And, and I first spoke in tongues when I was 12 years old. I got baptized, water baptized, and uh, I just loved Jesus at that time. I was uh, at 12 years old. They had me preaching to adults, and it was crazy. It was crazy what God had for my life. And the enemy worked overtime to destroy, and he stole years. And I'm not, I'm not concerned about the thievery of those years because God is the great I am. What I lost in that time, he is restoring right now. And God is, I haven't lost anything because I'm in Jesus. But, it, but when I didn't know that back then, back in the 70s, I didn't real, not realize and understand what was going on. And this condemnation and guilt and this, this lust that was put into me because, because of what others had done to me and I was just consumed by it. And eventually it got to the point where I couldn't, I couldn't contain it anymore and I, I would feel so guilty that before, before God and I would come and I'd say, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And I would try harder and I'd work harder. I'd get up early and I'd study the Word and I did. And I wrote books in notes and God was giving me revelation and, and more hurt would come and more hurt would come and I, and I was just like oh and eventually got to the point like how can you be loved when you let me go through this God you know what you're not worth it I refuse you if hell is where you are then that's where I want to be I hated God hated him because everything that God ever represented to me was impossible to attain, impossible to achieve, impossible to do that. I want to see, man, that person is sick. I want to see them healed. I would be walking down the street, 12 years old, 13 years old, with these young adults, 18, 16, 21 years old. I would have more courage than them. Let's go talk to that biker over there. He's got hell's angels. Hell is bad. Heaven is good. Let's go get him. Come on, come on. And they're like, you should... Calm down a little bit. Why? The worst, what's the worst they could do? Kill us? Man, we'll be with Jesus. Come on, let's go. And, you know, see, I come by this naturally. It's just, I don't know why God did it, but He did. I, I come by it naturally. And, I, and I, would, I would run after this. But in spite of all that God was doing in my life, in spite of the promotion, in spite of all of that, I still could not attain to what I was so hungry for in my spirit. And I fell, and I fell, and I fell to the point that I hate you, God. And, and, and it was because I was taught a system that this is what you got to do to get God's favor. When it finally came to me, when God took down through the years, He began a process and He just began to speak it over to me. And it finally hit me that you, we, uh, well, I'm, I'm righteous. I'm a son. I'm forgiven. I have been set free by the blood of Jesus. I will never be the same. And it doesn't matter how good I am or how bad I am. You mean you can't condemn me anymore? You mean that if I don't read my Bible today? You mean that if, I, if I'm too tired to stay awake in the prayer meeting? If you mean that you still love me and I'm okay with that? Yeah. Yes, son. Because you're my son. Well, the next time something came to me, it was like, uh, why would I do that? And all of the stuff that held authority over my life over the years gone by, it was absolutely canceled because of the truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, as a servant, I couldn't overcome. And as a servant, I came into bondage. And as a servant, I started rebelling against that bondage. Rebelling for the purpose of righteousness. Rebelling, saying, no, I won't commit that sin. You say I'm a slave to sin, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get into, I'm going to get into what the good books with God. I'm going to be the man of God. I'm going to do this. And this, and the, the taskmaster said, really? Correct. There goes the whip. You're going to have a little bit more work on you. You're going to have a little bit more trial on you. And eventually it got to the point where we broke him. He's done. He's out. We've canceled the assignment of God on his life. That's what the devil said. <laughs> devil took a look and said, look at where he is. See, we've got him with a knife at his wrist. We got him drinking alcohol. We, uh, yeah, he didn't kill himself there. We didn't get that semi to kill him in the head-on collision. We didn't get that um, uh, the overdose over here. Uh, the gun didn't get to him. But you know what? He's going to kill himself. It's going to be okay. We've canceled the assignment of God in his life. And then Jesus showed up. Because he never left me. I told you I was baptized, I spoke in tongues for the first time in the Holy Spirit when I was 12 years old. When I was walking in the heat of my rebellion. And, and, and when I say this, I would rather go to hell than to heaven because that's the only place that God is. I tended to forget that scripture that even if I make my bed in hell, He is there. <laughs> you just can't win. <laughs> it's, you know, 
try and be God, but man, even the worst that you can do, He's got a plan to love you. I mean, <laughs> throw out the worst, the, the most powerful thing. Shake your hand in the fist of God and say, I'll show you, God. And He'll go, yeah, I'll show you. I love you. I, how can God love us this much? I, uh, how can He be so gracious and so compassionate to us? I just, ah, it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So in the heat of my hatred against Him, I said to myself, I wonder if I can speak in tongues. Instantly. I thought, wow! Holy Spirit's still with me. I'm going to go get drunk. And I did. He never left me. I, 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 like, I'm, not, well, I'm not just a guy who's having a rough day. I'm a guy who's on the wrong side of the fence. I'm a guy who's, you know, like if, if, if I was around in the time when the Jesus was alive, I would have been with the guard saying, we're here to crucify you. You're bad. He's, we're good. You're bad. We, yes, we're going to bring righteousness and justice to this country, and we're going to be the salvation. We're going to kill you. That's who I would have been. And he said, here's a gift with no condition and no strings attached. Even if you do go to hell, I'm still with you. How can you fail? I mean, I, 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 there, is a, there is a group of people. There's a waitress over at the Zodiac right now. And there's an owner over, over at the Zodiac. I met them last night. And while I wasn't able to give a whole witness and, and speak prophetically because I didn't have any words of knowledge or prophetic for that waitress, I was able to say, you know that God loves you. Don't ever sell yourself short. Do you know that? That you're awesome? And she says, yeah, smile's better than a frown and it's free too. And I said, keep going, girl. Keep going. You, because God loves them. And they are hungry for this gospel. They are hungry to know that they are accepted. People are giving themselves to all of the stuff that is out there. Whether it's business or sports or illicit drugs or, or immorality or what. They're giving it to it because they're so hungry to be accepted. So hungry to be in love. Good news. If you are in Jesus, if you say, Lord, I'm guilty, make me righteous, all unrighteousness is removed, I'm, I'm clean. I'm absolutely accepted. I'm, I'm in the beloved. And that's good news. That's really good news. And, and so I walked in this rebellion and the Holy Spirit was still with me. And, and I, you know, I had to repent recently of my offense against the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I knew that in the midst of my speaking in tongues how bad of a sinner I really was. I knew that, and, and I had watched, I was in, in Bible college, Trevor talked about that, uh, you know, we were in cemetery. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I've been raised from the dead. <laughs> oh, God, God loves the seminaries. <laughs> uh, we were in college together, and, and uh, uh, uh Actually, Sean and I were in college together, and uh, at, at NBC. Now it's called Vanguard. And I, I remember seeing people who were they were speaking in tongues and worshiping God, and then they would tell me how they were so addicted to pornography and they couldn't break free, and they were sin, 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 sin. One moment, you know, James says, "Can can a can a freshwater fountain bring salt water? Can an orange tree produce apples?" And yet, I was watching. I'm saying, "That does not look like apples to me. That looks like weeds to me. That doesn't look like righteousness to me." And, and yet, we were saying, "We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit with fire and power. We need. Come on, if you just speak in tongues, everything will be all better." And I have watched, and I have watched, and I have watched over and over again. But but speaking in tongues does not eliminate sin from people's lives. I have watched and seen how, man, you live more like the devil than some of the non-Christians that I know, and yet you speak in tongues, and you're so you're so great and proud about this. I was talking to a businessman on Friday morning, Thursday morning, and uh, as I was talking to him, he was he was talking about how he redeemed this company that was in the middle of a lawsuit, and there was millions of dollars being being spent by on, on lawyers trying to get this money and the guy brought he brought them all together he said because if we can talk and if we can just appreciate one another and see where we're following just a godly man 
and he stopped all the lawsuits. But the source of all of the trouble was coming from a Christian. This Christian who was so proud of, I love Jesus and I do these Bible studies and I go to church and he was just, he was so happy about, yeah, God loves me and I've made my fortune by suing everybody that I can find. And I'm a multi-millionaire by, by destroying the lives of others. And so this man of God said, you should do some deep soul searching because you just said on tape and we've recorded it that you made your millions or your fortune, whatever it was, by suing people. That isn't God. And, and, and so the, the world looks at the church, and I, I come across this all the time. I see somebody say, can I pray for you? It's, no! You cannot pray for me. Uh, you, I don't want you to do it. And the reason they're doing this is because they have seen what has happened in the church. They have seen the lack of power. They have seen the, the lack of love. They have seen all that stuff. And they're going, I don't want what you have. That's an offense to me. It's not good enough for me. Walk away from me. And I watched it in my own life. And the very thing that I hated, I, I mean, I, I got to hate Christians because they're such hypocrites. They say one thing and do the other thing. And then I found I was doing exactly the same thing that they were. I was being a hypocrite. But I sure felt justified in my hypocrisy. My arrogance and pride that were just so permeating my life. And here's the amazing, crazy thing about, the, about when I was in that state. Because I believed in Jesus, I was actually righteous. But I didn't know it. I didn't know it. Warning, this is the spit zone. <laughs> so <laughs> I get a little enthusiastic, get a little dry mouth, so just be careful. Um, I, I, I didn't know it. But when the revelation came, and see, this is revelation. You don't get this simply by some some guy saying, well, you're righteous because Jesus said you're righteous. If you'll just confess and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9. It, 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 it's a matter of the Holy Spirit revealing it to your heart. Because once it gets in your heart and your heart believes it, that's when the change happens. And what the world is looking for is a consistent walk of Jesus that said, I see you where you are at, and I love you, and I will pick you up, and I will embrace you. What they're looking for is an encounter that Jesus had with a woman caught in adultery. The law and the Pharisees came and they found this woman in the very act, and they were race discriminatory because they let the guy go and took her and they brought her up to, to Jesus. They publicly humiliated her. They degraded her. They took everything away from her. And they said, this woman was caught in the very activity. And she was exactly that, caught a captive. She wasn't doing that because, because it just felt good. She was captive to sin. She was doing the only thing that was most natural for her. She was looking for love. She was looking for acceptance. She was trying to find her place in a society in that day. But she was captured. Satan had come along or, or sin had come along under the dominion of darkness and bound her up and now she was captive. And if she wanted to say no, she couldn't say no because she was a captive. They spoke the prophetic word over her. She is a captive. Now Moses says, the law says, she's got to die. Yes, sir, she's got to die. And we got the stones. We're ready to kill her. We're ready to throw the stone. And so many times, we as a church, because we're living under the law, even our charismatic law, that you've got to have these many signs and wonders. You've got to be in the river. You've got to have this feeling. You've got to have this. Or you've got to have that. You've got to be shaking. You've got to be laughing. And if you don't have that, well, then you should press and try a little bit harder. And we create law, and we bring condemnation, and we bring guilt. When the Bible says, if you'll just believe this is who you are, you're free. Free indeed. If you speak in tongues or you don't speak in tongues, if you bring someone to, to Jesus or don't bring somebody to Jesus, if you bring healing to somebody or don't bring healing to somebody, you are loved. It's not about what you do. And this is not a, a, a seminar and a conference to say, come on, work a little bit harder. Get out there and do the stuff because it's so good. It feels so good and you'll be stronger for it. That is not what I am saying. I am saying that regardless of what happens, you are loved. 
You are, you are absolutely embraced before the foundation of the world who said, I love you so much I can't stand it anymore. You, I've got to bring them into the world right now because they need some hugging and they need some loving and they need some affection and they need to feel the dance of God and hear the song of God because I have a song to sing over you. And that's good news. It's absolutely good news. And so they were, this is John chapter 8 again, they were, they were saying, we've got the stones and we've got the law and we're ready to kill because of our own hurts and our own failures in our lives and because of this. And we will make sure that we never get hurt again. And we will make sure that we don't let this, this immorality in our country because it's hurt me. So I'm going to kill you because I've been hurt. Uh, and that's what's happened. So many of us, we've been hurt, we've been wounded, and our identity has become our wounding. Our identity has become our addiction. Our identity has become everything that's wrong because a snake over here came and bit somebody and said, this is who you are. Jesus says it's not who you are. You're righteous. You're pure. You're lovely. You're altogether desirable. You're a lily to Him. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. But if you don't know that, if you think that you're caught and that you think that, you're, that, that sin is your identity or that wound is your identity, you will do something to deal with it whether you like it or not. You've been hardwired to deal with your heart. You can try and shut your heart down all you want, but you will deal with it. How many of us have ever been in that place? I'll never do that again. 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 I did it again. Because you cannot deny your heart. You can't. You were made in the image of God. God is all about love. God is a spirit. Those who worship Him in spirit, worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's what God is looking for. Your heart is your spirit. You can't deny what God has created. You can try. And, and that's what the enemy has been doing ever since he took the dominion from Adam from the time of the present right to now. Is saying, I will rule your heart. I will take over you. I will keep you in this bondage. And God's saying, no. No, 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 no. You were made for love. You were made to experience His freedom. You were made to experience His goodness. I'm going to put my power in you, and I'm going to give you hope, and you're going to speak to people because of who you are. Your heart will not be denied. I feel some fire on this. Your heart will not be denied. It will not be denied. You know inherently that you were made for health. Your heart will not be denied. Give way to that thought. You know that you were made for more. You know that you were made for excellency. Your heart will not be denied. Let your heart be free to receive it. Let your heart be free to receive it. Not I, I just speak prophetically right now. By the word of the Lord, hearts be opened up to receive that you will not be denied. The desires that God has placed in your heart are His desires and they are going to come to pass because He will not let it be denied. Your heart will not be denied. And we, you get this truth inside of you and now suddenly all of these offenses and all of this stuff that has been there, you see it for what it is and you go, I'm walking in freedom. And now the people look at you and go, why are you so different? I, I was at the fringe last year and the year before that. Because the fringe is, is God's calling place for beloved sons and daughters. <sighs> Think about that where they're doing their immoral plays and their drinking and their, their drunkenness and their, their all that stuff. Do you know it's a gathering put together by the Spirit of God to call sons and daughters to repentance if the church will see it? I, I'm on a, I guess I'm on a trail right now, but you know what? Consider this, Elisha and Elijah. I heard Pastor Paula White say this the other day. Sons can see what the seers can't. The seers, the prophets said to Elisha, Hey, do you know that God's going to take your father from you? Do you know that he's going to be taken away? You should prepare yourself. You know, why don't you go get start mourning? Why don't you do something? And Elisha was, shut up. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Because I've been with my father and I know what you don't know. I'm going to have more of him in my life because I'm going to get a double portion. There are prophetic words that are going out that say America is going to be racked with pain and persecution. There's going to be an economic collapse. There's going to be a nuclear bomb go off in one of the coastal cities. California is going to fall off the map. There's going to be an earthquake. Judgment is coming. And I'm sure it's the word of the Lord. That's what the prophets have seen. My question is, what are the sons 
seed. Because when the sun shows up, there's good news. When the sun shows up, he says, I decree freedom. When the sun shows up, he says, I set the captive free. When the sun shows up, then he says, good news to the poor. Give sight to the blind. Make the land to walk. Set the captives free. In the middle of judgment that comes, mercy triumphs over judgment. But it is the sons of God. It is the ones who know Him in His intimacy, who know who they are, that are going to set these people free. And when the world is saying, it's hopeless, there's nothing left for us, there's going to be those who are shining like bright shining stars, and they're going to go, we want what you have, because they've been set free by the love of God. That's you. Man, where did that come from? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus stooped down and began to write on the ground. And he, they stood with their stones. She's in her shame before the feet of Jesus. She's in her fear knowing that these people know how to kill. She's without hope at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus is writing in the ground. What went through her mind at that time? Is he writing judgment against me? I'm sure that the only thing that went through her mind because she was bound by fear and bound by her shame and bound by her sin, there was nothing good coming out of this. This is only going to be bad. I'm sure that's what was in her heart. But just because she felt that, just because she had it, did not change the heart of God. Just because you think that God may be mad at you, just because you think that there's been this offense in your life, just because you think that because I haven't seen somebody healed, they won't, this person that I pray for won't be healed, it didn't, that doesn't change the heart of God. Well, you, 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 I've heard it over and over. Because of a generational sin or because of bitterness or because of unforgiveness, because they don't believe, that's why God's not healing them. I can't pray for you until you believe. So I've got to preach to you and let you know about all the things of the goodness of God so that faith will rise in your heart. Now I'm going to pray for you and you'll be healed. And it really does happen a lot that way. It does. But I read the Bible and I read about Jesus and I look at it and I study and I find that Jesus went to a person let down through a, through a, through a, a, a ceiling the homeowner must have been really impressed. They let this paralytic boy down. And the first thing that Jesus says to the guys, Take heart, son. 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 When did he ask for His God's heart was already there. Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. When did he ask for forgiveness? That guy might have thought, well, God might or might not heal me. There's a chance that maybe my life isn't established. But no matter what that guy was thinking was, he was being let down through that cot. There was, no matter what was going on, the heart of God was towards him. I see you as a son. You're forgiven. There's no offense. And by the way, you're healed. Get up and take your walk and walk away. That, whether he believed or not, whether his friends believed or not, obviously they did because they were ready to wreck a house to get him to Jesus. But even if they didn't believe, even if somebody had paid them the money to vandalize that house, to let this guy down and try and trick and, and make a mockery of Jesus, it would not change what was in the heart of God. It would not change who Jesus was and is and is to come. And his heart would still be, Son, you're forgiven. Get up, take your bed and walk because I love you. When the guy was at the pool of Bethesda for... I think it was 38 years. He had committed sin because Jesus, after the fact, said, Stop sinning or something worse will come to you. He was there because of his sin. And Jesus says to him, Would you like to be healed? You don't know the problems that I have. <laughs> Let's sing a sad song today. Elton John, come on, help me out here. Sad songs. Rainy days. Nobody's willing to help me. Nobody. I mean, that is the wrong answer. It's a simple yes or no. Would you like to be healed? Yes, sir. Right now. But no, he gets on and he gives the, the pain of his heart and he speaks about what's wrong in his life. And Jesus says, doesn't matter, you're healed. Get up and walk. If it's true that sin can prevent healing, if it's true that generational bondages can break healing, then Jesus sure messed up because there was not one single person that he prayed for that didn't have a sin issue in their lives. They were all pre-Old Testament or pre-covenant. They were all in the Old Covenant. Jesus hadn't died and resurrected from their dead. They all had issues, including Lazarus. And Jesus healed them all. Do 
Don't you tell me that the person who is involved in Satanism and, and a person that has been hurt in their life or they've had addictions and stuff like that, that somehow they've got to go and get themselves fixed up before they can get some healing in their life. God is not changing His heart towards you. He loves you. He paid the price. He did it all. He will heal. He will set you free. He will do it because of who He is and because of who you are. You don't need to be afraid of what the people are thinking out there. You don't need to be afraid of their hurt and their indifference and all of that stuff. You don't need to be afraid of that because the God in you is greater than all of that. And even if they're filled with sin, and even if they're anti-God for crying out loud, He loves them enough to fix them. He healed Malchus, the guy who's here. He came to arrest Jesus, the servant of the priest or, or guard, whatever it was. And Jesus didn't even talk to the guy. He, you know, it, it was... Pick up the ear. Peter, how can you do that? There, okay? Stop doing that. Come on. Don't you know that this is my father's will for me? And Malchus is like, oh, let's go arrest him, Malchus. Uh, oh, did you see what he did? I still have the blood. And the goal of Jesus was, I, I need to love Malchus. He's not my enemy. These people who are arresting me, even Judas who betrayed him with a kiss, was not the enemy of Jesus from Jesus' heart. Do you know that in Jewish culture, the most honorable place that you can have at, at, a, at a feast is at the left hand? When they were having the Last Supper, you know where Judas was sitting? The most honored and highest place that he could have among the twelve was given to Judas. You know why? Because the kindness of God leads you to repentance. And God was showing him kindness. He knew what Judas was going to do. And every step along the way, he says, you're a thief? Well, I'm going to give you the money. Because I'm going to show you kindness. And I'm going to set you free. Every step along the way, Judas was given every day, every opportunity. He did not pass over a line where he was beyond the reach of God. Even when Satan filled him and Jesus said, go and do what you were going to do and do it quickly. It was not a word of judgment. It was a word of redemption. Because when this happens, I will die for you and you will be forgiven. And if you accept me, I will cleanse you and set you free. You don't have to hang yourself. You don't have to die. Judas, I love you. God loved Judas. It still does. Like that's, that is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. While we were yet enemies, Christ loved us. God loved us and died for us. He manifested His Son. He manifested Jesus. He loved us. His heart was not changed. It has not and will not change. He knew what Adam was going to do. And his first response to Adam when Adam sinned, when he made a willful choice to say, I choose Eve over God. And he took that fruit. When they were clothed in, in leaves and they were, they were estranged from God, God's response to him was, now because of what you did and you brought the earth and all that is in it, you brought it under the dominion of Satan and that's a curse. God didn't curse the earth. We read it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Now the earth is cursed because of what you have done. God's heart is not cursing. God, oh man, we've got it so much in our minds because we read the prophets and say, it says, you're cursed because you have all, you've done all these wrong things. We, we, we read about judgment and we read it from our, from our servant perspective and we think God is angry and he wants to judge and he wants to pour it out. God will judge sin, but it, his heart is not cursing. God is love. When judgment comes out, it comes from a heart of love. It comes from a heart of mercy. God will not be denied. He is love. They said, now because of what you have done, the earth is cursed. You brought this curse on. Here's what I'm going to do, Adam. I'm going to make you the father of nations. The father of mankind. I gave you one command. Adam repented and fulfilled his command. What was that command? Be fruitful and multiply. Adam became the father of Enoch down the road. Became the father of Methuselah. Became the father of Noah. Became the father of Seth. Became the father of the man of Shem. Became the father of David. Became the father of Jesus. And he's written in the genealogy in, in Luke chapter 2, I think it is. Adam is listed as the father, the one, the son of God. God's response, as soon as we had sin in his life, as soon as a tragedy had come, I'm going to bring the greatest blessing mankind will ever know through you.
through the source of your greatest failure, I'm going to bring the source of the greatest blessing. Eve who was deceived, and she was the one who first touched that fruit. She was the one who took that first bite. She was the one who, who opened up the door for the enemy. He says, now because of this, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have pain in childbirth, and you're going to multiply your pains, but you're going to be the one whose seed is going to crush the head of the enemy. Eve, the source of your greatest failure, the source of your greatest deception, is going to become the source of the best blessing ever, Jesus. Man, when you go out and talk to people and you look at people, when you see their failure, the enemy says, see, this disqualifies. This, what you did disqualifies you. You don't measure up anymore. God looks at them and I want to, you know, receive this into your spirit, receive it into your heart. When you see these people at their failures, you say, this is the source of your greatest success. When you bring it into the light of God's presence. Come on. Has anybody ever messed up? Has anybody ever had a failure in your life? Bring it into the light of Jesus and it will become the source transformed of your greatest blessing. That's the way our God works. That's good news. So when you go out today and when you do your stuff and, and as you're functioning in your life, if you mess up and the enemy tries to bring condemnation and guilt to you, this is a source of this is a source of blessing. And if this is a source of blessing, Paul said, if the curse, if the if the downfall of Israel meant the blessing of the world, how much more when they come to know Him? You know, if if sin in my life and bringing it to Jesus and being cleansed from all unrighteousness and being forgiven produces such blessing, how much more when I walk in love with Him, when I walk as a son and I'm walking in His purity and I'm walking in His revelation, how much more will it bring? I'm telling you, we can't lose. You can't disappoint God. You can't lose. You can't fail Him because He's already taken care of everything because of who we are. Your sin doesn't change who He is. So stop holding on to it. Release it. Because it's, it's freedom. And if you can't release it, if you don't have the power, if you don't have the legs, if you don't have the arms, if you don't have the eyes, give it to Jesus. He'll be your arms, legs, and eyes and He will set you free. There is no thing that is hindering you anymore. There is no power that is hindering you anymore. And this terrifies the devil. It scares him. I, I, well, you can almost say it scares the hell out of him, but really it doesn't. It drives hell deeper into him. And that's a good, I like that. I like that a lot. It's time that we started scaring hell into the devil and loving the hell out of people. This is, and this is what we can do this. We can do this. It's not difficult. All it means is, be yourself. Be what God intended for you to be. So this lady is there, and, and you know, Jesus is writing, and he says, all right. You know, that got to sound really good when you're in your worst position, and God stands up and says, all right, go ahead. This is a bad day. This is a really bad day. Except he who is without sin casts the first stone. Oh, boy. These are the religious leaders. I'm dead. I could never measure up to them. This is done. How come there's no stones? What's going on? <laughs> and then Jesus says, Woman, where are your accusers? And she first time looks around and I wasn't there, so I kind of adding lib to this thing, but I, I, I'm just I can feel in my heart as she looks around and goes. <gasps> It's only one. They're gone. Lord, you're the only one who was able to make them go away. You're the only one. They're gone. And then Jesus says to her, Me neither. <laughs> I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. You want someone to stop sinning? love them. She couldn't stop sinning. She was a captive. When Jesus comes into your life, the first thing He's going to do to you is He's going to say, all of those accusers and all of those ones that are standing with the stones and all of that past and all of that stuff in the future and all of that stuff that is against you, go. 
And then when all of that stuff is scattered and gone and it's all, there's no one accusing because God removes the accusation. You will come into freedom when your accusers are gone. He scatters the accusers and there's nobody left. And now He says, I love you. I'm not condemning you. You're my daughter. I love you. Now you're free. You're truly free. No longer are you a captive because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And that woman went and she did not sin anymore. She followed Jesus in freedom and was filled with joy. And her life became a testimony for the Lord. A testimony of His love. And it wasn't that God was looking for a testimony. He wasn't looking for a... Um, a, a to say, hey, look at what God has done. What he, was, what he was doing was saying, I love you. And that's the secret. We're not trying to get testimonies here. We're trying to love people. Actually, we're not trying. We just do love people because that's what we do. Now we become the righteousness of God. And now that I don't see that sin anymore, but now I see Jesus and I see that righteousness and this is who I am, well, of course I'm going to do what is right because the one who is righteous does right. A fish swims in water because a fish is a fish. A, a tiger walks in the jungle and eats meat because it's a tiger. And an elephant eats peanuts because an, it's an elephant. And, and monkeys climb in trees because they're monkeys. And humans who are righteous do righteous because they are righteous. See, it's what Jesus did. It's His blood. It's His work. It's His righteousness. This is why communion is such a wonderful thing because by His body I've been redeemed. By His blood I enter into a new covenant of grace. It's not about me anymore. It's all about Him. I enter back into that state where Adam was perfect before God, loved before God, a brand new creation in Him. The old is passed away and it's a good day, I just go out and I smile at somebody. I walk into a restaurant, I walk into a store, and the place has changed because I simply showed up. That's you. That's you. You know, we're going to see things change. We're going to see people set free. We're going to see life taking place around us, not because of what we know up here, but because what we know in here. Jesus said, if a man believing in his heart, and there's the key, in his heart, Whatever he says, it will be done. If you have faith, you can do anything if it's in your heart. But if it's just up here, if it's just in here and you don't really believe this, it doesn't matter how righteous you are. It doesn't how much you know about righteousness. It doesn't matter about all that stuff. You, you won't live it out. It's, it's got to be in your heart. That's why it's got to be a revelation by the Spirit of God. And I really believe that right now he's speaking through me and he is giving revelation to your heart. You just say yes, yes, yes. And you... Just like that. And just like that woman, go and live your life. I have a spiritual daughter, and uh, she was telling me some stuff. I said to her, Honey, do you know that you have permission to live? Do you know that it's right for you to have desires and live? She started crying. She says, You're the first person who's ever told me that. I said, go and live. Just go and live. Because your past isn't against you. There's no more condemnation. There's no more guilt. There's none of that. Do you know how beautiful you are? Do you know how much God loves you? Do you know? You know what? Jesus is saying to you today, just go and live. I'll walk with you. Where you don't know how, where you don't have the ability, I do. And I'm just going to walk with you. Hey, that's good news, isn't it? That's just freedom. So much freedom. When people see that in you, they're going to come to you. And when I was at the fringe, I, I started to say it the other, uh, 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 before I got off on a rabbit trail, I was talking at this gathering place in front of the psychic fair, speaking in tongues. <laughs> Still do like tongues. That's good, you know. And uh, people were saying, hey, have you been to this psychic before? No, but did you know God loves you? And they're like, huh, what? And just speaking good words to them. And there was a couple there, and they were sitting there. We ended up getting into a conversation. I began to tell them this very story about righteousness. I began to talk to them about life. I got, began to talk to them about love of God. And these people who don't go to church, don't have really anything to do with it, they were loving me and loving me. And they said, do you have a church? Because I would come to your church. And they'll come to your church. Because you are the church. And when they feel loved, I mean, come on, can I have a hug? That's the church. That's the Holy Spirit. 
people are in the world and they're just calling you up in the bar and they're saying, would you please come out? You know, it's, it's the bar. It's the nightclub. They're single down there. Can I have a hug? Man, this is good. I was at that bar just over there in the 80s and 90s. It used to be called Berry Tees, I think. I don't know what it is, a ranch or something. And they had a great smorgasbord there once upon a time too. And I remember being in there and I'm drinking my, my, my whiskey and my beer and I'm looking for sin. And I remember standing there and going, oh, I'm so unhappy. If I could just talk to this guy. And I remember walking outside in that very parking lot over there. I remember this as clear as the day is long. This would have been about 87. Maybe 86, one, it's somewhere in there. And I remember standing and saying, God, if you would just send a man of God to me and I could get a hug right now, I'd give you my life right now. I was drunk. Nobody came. I went, okay, that settles it. I know where I stand. Give me a double. <laughs> that didn't end the story. God was way bigger than my misunderstanding and way bigger than anybody's disobedience or obedience. He came and got me and He loved me right back into His fellowship. And I am a righteous son and you're righteous sons and daughters. He, 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 that isn't the end of the story. And so don't be feeling sorry and going guilt and condemnation. But what I am saying is there is somebody out there who is saying, I love what you have because of who you are and I would sure like a hug from you. And you can give that. You don't need to feel, you know, just if anybody's feeling condemned, they're like, oh, I need to do something, you know, knock it off. That's the enemy. The enemy is not condemning you here. But what he is saying is, do you know who you are? Do you know how valuable you are? Do you know how excellent you are? Do you know the glory that resides in you? Do you know the hope that you are? And, and do you know that it's not about how spectacular you are in your speaking and the miracles and the crusades and the signs and wonders? It's just because of who you are. You qualified. You, <laughs> you don't got to go to seminary. You don't got to go and get all of the, the latest crusades and all of the latest conferences and all that stuff. You are already accepted in the Beloved. You are already righteous. You are already filled with His glory. You are complete in Him. And that's it. You're complete in Him. Oh God, give me more of your love. What are you talking about? He's already given you all of His love. But I just don't feel it. It doesn't matter whether you feel it. You already have all of His love. Give me more power. What are you talking about? Jesus said, all authority and power is given unto me, and I am with you to the end of the ages. All authority is right with you right now. All power is with you right now. What, is, what we ought to be saying is, Father, I thank you that you've given me all this stuff. Now just open up my heart so that I can understand this and come into revelation with this thing so that I can walk in the fullness of it. Because He's not held back anything from you. He's already given everything to you. You lack nothing. First, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 1. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where's the heavenly places? Yeah, right here. Jelly belly here. <laughs> but I worked hard to get this. I'm kind of proud of it. <laughs> All my life I was skinny, so I, I don't I'm not I don't apologize for a little extra. <laughs> the blessing of the Lord maketh fat. Ha ah, yes God, thank you very much. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is inside. If I've been blessed with all spiritual blessings, I've got them right here, right now. Don't let anybody sell you short. Don't let anybody say, Well, if you don't have this experience, then you're never going to have it. Oh, come on. The Bible doesn't lie. What Jesus said is the truth. What God said is the truth. And He has not made a mistake. You have all things. You are complete in Him. So lengthen your tent pegs. Spread it out a little bit more. because it, So that more and more of what you already have can manifest in you. Does anybody feel encouraged here this morning? Thank you. You know, I just... Thank you, Jesus. I really believe, you know, God, well, I believe this is a prophetic word. This, this message is a prophetic word to you. You're not here by accident. You have a hunger and a desire in your heart. God showed me this a couple of days ago. You have been so hungry and so thirsty for Him. And I felt like this morning, as I was praying a couple of days ago, and, and just 
you know, preparing my heart, saying, God, how do I put this together? And I just, as I, as I was praying, I felt God saying, this needs to break through on Saturday morning. It needs to break through. And I, I had intentions of going back to this thing as we didn't get to it last night. And here we are this morning. I'm totally, totally got sidetracked. But I realized that as I was praying, God was saying, I'm going to release a prophetic word because the prophetic word is the word of life. It, it, it's changing destiny. It's changing and opening up revival. It's, it's setting the captive free. And this prophetic word will not return void. You are here because you have been called by God. You are here because He divinely appointed you. And I know that there are great, there's a great prophet in Red Deer. There's a, a man of God just over here. There's other conferences and stuff around, but God hand chose you. He picked you out of everybody that is in this city of a million people and said, you, you, my sons and my daughters, I want you to be here because I have a specific word for you. And if you're over in those other places, you won't get it. And that's that, it, it's who you are. It's righteousness. It's love. And so I, I just, I'm trusting right now that Jesus is described in Revelation. Wow. I think we missed our coffee break. Jesus, just five minutes here. Jesus said in Revelation that when a sharp two-edged sword was proceeding from his mouth. That the word of God right now, the prophetic word comes as a sword to pierce you. He's piercing your heart. The word of God is sharp and powerful, dividing between the joints and the marrow, between the spirit and the soul, and it's piercing in. And he's coming at surgical precision with the prophetic word to pierce your heart so that you will never be the same. He's cutting off the garbage and the things that have been condemning you. And he's saying, no, this is who you are. It's who you always have been. I've always loved you. It's always been this way. But an enemy has been lying to you. And just like Paul, the scales are coming off right now because God is not content and He will not be denied to have you in bondage because He loves you too much to let you go. He loves you too much to let you be sidetracked by other things. He loves you too much to give up on you. And so He's just saying, here's the Word and it's going deep into your heart. And if you will say yes, 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 you just that's all it is. It's just yes, I believe it. Where you have inability, He makes it up because He's saying... When you're cut by His Word, you're never the same again. And so I, I had to release that this morning. Because you're history makers. Because of who you are. It's not too late, never has been too late. It's not too early, never has been too early. Today is your day. Today is your day of love. Because you're amazing. And you are so loved. Unbel oh, over the top. Over the top. So Father, in Jesus' name, would you release the angelic government of heaven right over this place right now and, and enforce the Word of God. You said that your servants are ministers to fulfill your Word. And so Lord, I'm asking for, for the Word to be guarded, to be cultivated and nurtured in the hearts of these your sons and your daughters. That these your sons and your daughters would grow up into the stature of the fullness of Christ. That they would grow up in your love. That they would grow up and be so transformed that all they can do is be like you because that's what they are. I ask Holy Spirit for, for, that, for the stirring and the activation right now because you, the kingdom of heaven, is dwelling in each one of them. So Holy Spirit, be activated right now. And I call for the streams that are inside each one of them. Flow, flow, flow right now. Let that joy flow. Let that mercy, that compassion, the fruit of the Spirit, the, the, the greatness of your presence, God. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. And Father, out of this place, Lord, that they will be able to eat the fruit of righteousness. That they will be able to eat the fruit and be able to give to others because of what you're doing in them. Holy Spirit, just in your fire come. Holy Spirit, just watch and hover over us. Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus. Holy Spirit, strengthen us in the inner man to know the height and the depth and the width and the immensity of love. Because Holy Spirit, we want to see the God who is able to do immeasurably above and beyond what we can think or imagine. So now, Holy Spirit, do it in Jesus' name. Because it's your will and you love your people. These are your children. So I release it, Father. And I, I thank you for the fruit that is coming. I thank you that you are faithful in your word. I thank you that you are faithful to your people. And that we are not going to be disappointed because you're the God of all hope, not the God of disappointment. 
Thank you for your word, Father. It does not return void. And there is a harvest. And there is breakthrough. And there is excellency. Because you are. And, and these your children are. So thank you for them, Father. Thank you for this love. And as you pray, Jesus, that they would be kept by the power of your name, that your power and your glory would be released on them, God. And Father, just, yeah, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.